Hey, faithful listener, welcome to season six of the Bible Explained podcast, the podcast where the Bible gets explained. So grab your cup of coffee and enjoy today's discussion from the book of Joshua. Happy Wednesday, friends and faithful listeners. This is Jen with the Bible Explained podcast. Today we're talking about Joshua chapter 22, and I've got my delicious cup of coffee right here. I hope that you also have yours and that you're willing to share a cup with me while we discuss scripture together. So let's go ahead and read Joshua 22 verses 1 through 20 today, and we're going to talk about this really crazy story, actually, that I never remembered reading before. So I'm excited to talk about this because I feel like this can really be applied. Well, all of scripture can, but this can definitely be applied to the church nowadays and how the church is supposed to respond to things that might corrupt the church, if that makes sense. Now, as usual, I'll be reading on the W.E.B. version of the Bible this morning. Grab your cup of coffee or your cup of tea and let's join in reading Joshua 22, 1 through 20. Then Joshua called the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, and said to them, You have kept all that Moses, the servant of Yahweh, commanded you, and you have listened to my voice in all that I commanded you. You have not left your brothers these many days to this day, but you have performed the duty of the commandment of Yahweh your God. Now Yahweh your God has given rest to your brothers, as he spoke to them. Therefore now return and go to your tents, to the land of your possession, which Moses, the servant of Yahweh, gave you beyond the Jordan. Only take diligent heed to do the commandment and the law, which Moses, the servant of Yahweh, commanded you, to love Yahweh your God, to walk in all of his ways, to keep his commandments, to hold fast to him, and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. So Joshua blessed them and sent them away, and they went to their tents. Now to the one half-tribe of Manasseh, Moses had given an inheritance in Bashan, but Joshua gave to the other half among their brothers beyond the Jordan westward. Moreover, when Joshua sent them away to their tents, he blessed them, and he spoke to them, saying, Return with much wealth to your tents, and very much livestock, with silver, with gold, with bronze, with iron, and with very much clothing. Divide the plunder of your enemies with your brothers." The children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh returned and departed from the children of Israel out of Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan, to go to the land of Gilead, to the land of their possession, which they owned, according to the commandment of Yahweh by Moses. When they came to the region near the Jordan, that is, in the land of Canaan, the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh built an altar there by the Jordan, a great altar to look at. The children of Israel heard this. Behold, the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh have built an altar along the border of the land of Canaan in the region around the Jordan. When Israel heard of it, the whole congregation of Israel gathered themselves together at Shiloh to go up against them to war. The children of Israel sent to the children of Reuben and to the children of Gad and to the half-tribe of Manasseh into the land of the Gilead, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the priest. With him were ten princes, one prince of the father's house for each of the tribes of Israel. And they were each head of their father's houses among the thousands of Israel. They came to the children of Reuben, to the children of Gad, and to the half-tribe of Manasseh, to the land of Gilead, and they spoke with them, saying, The whole congregation of Yahweh says, What trespass is this that you have committed against the God of Israel to turn away from following Yahweh, and that you have built yourselves an altar to rebel against Yahweh? Is the iniquity of Peor too little for us, from which we have not cleansed ourselves to this day? Although there came a plague on the congregation of Yahweh, that you must turn away today from following Yahweh? If it will be, since you rebel against Yahweh today, that tomorrow he will be angry with the whole congregation of Israel. However, if the land of your possession is unclean, then pass over to the land of the possession of Yahweh, in which Yahweh's tabernacle dwells, and take possession among us, but don't rebel against Yahweh nor rebel against us, in building an altar other than Yahweh our God's altar. Didn't Achan, the son of Zerah, commit a trespass in the devoted thing, and wrath fell on all the congregation of Israel? That man didn't perish alone in his iniquity. So I'm going to stop there on a cliffhanger, <laughs> and we'll talk about the rest of the story on Friday. But I want to talk about this first portion because I think it's very, very important. So it says that Joshua called the Reubites, Reubenites, I'm sorry, Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh, and he said to them, 
you have kept everything that Moses told you to do. So if you remember, even though the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh had land already given to them on the other side of the Jordan River, they didn't actually go take that land yet. They went into the promised land with all the other tribes and helped them fight so that the other tribes could settle. Then they were supposed to take their land on the other side of the Jordan for themselves. And so now Joshua tells them, he's like, you know, you've been here for years. You've helped the Israelites conquer their pieces of land. You've done everything that Moses told you to do. You were obedient. So now go take your possession, take wealth with you, take this blessing with you and go in peace, basically. But he gives them a caveat. He says, now, when you go back into your land, the one thing you need to do is to serve God and obey him with all of your heart and keep his commandments. And also he says, hold fast to him. So basically he says, go in peace, but just remember to never stop serving Yahweh, because even though you're on the other side of the Jordan River, you're still part of the Israeli community. And so you need to do what God is telling you to do. And then basically Joshua blesses all of them and gives them a bunch of wealth. And he tells the half tribe of Manasseh to split it equally and then just go with their wealth and take their pieces of land, which were already taken, by the way. I don't know exactly how that worked exactly if they had to like retake them because people like moved back in or if somehow they still managed to take hold of that land and keep it on the other side of the Jordan. I'm not sure. But anyway, Joshua gives them the blessing. And so they all leave with their wealth, which they earned themselves, by the way. So anyway, it says that they return back home. They departed from the children of Israel and went back into the land of Gilead, which was where their land was. And so all of a sudden they start building this giant altar. <laughs> like practically, practically immediately is what it sounds like. They start building this huge altar. And so the Israelites that are in the promised land hear about it. And they're like gossiping among themselves. And they're like, did you hear that the Reubenites, the Gadites and the half tribe of Manasseh like started building this huge grand altar? And so naturally they start thinking that these two and a half tribes on the other side of the Jordan are starting to worship other gods because altars were very, very prominent in pagan cultures. Basically, everybody used altars. But God had said that only the altar that was at the temple was where the people were supposed to worship and the altars that were specifically uh, established by God, basically. Those were the only ones that the people were allowed to use. In fact, there was a law in the Old Testament where God said, you cannot just sacrifice to God anywhere you want. That is against God's law. Because we've talked about this before. The reason God put that in place is because that would spiral very quickly. Like if people started sacrificing animals like in their backyard without a priest there to observe, eventually it would just get worse and worse and worse to the point where people would sacrifice anything they wanted at any point in time and it wouldn't be done the right way and there would be no priests doing it. God specifically wanted the priests, the Levites, to be the one sacrificing the animals to God, because not only would this uh, keep things orderly, it would also cut back on the amount of death of animals. There are many laws, actually, God puts in place specifically for animal health, actually. So God does love animals and he cares deeply about animals as well. And so you can see the many ways that it would spiral if people just started you know, sacrificing animals wherever they wanted and didn't listen to God. And you can see how that would uh, cause problems in the future in many different ways, actually. So everything was supposed to be done orderly. And so that's why this huge altar that gets erected all of a sudden is so offensive to the Israelites that are living inside the promised land. And they see the two and a half tribes doing this and they go out to war. 
with their own brothers because they did not want God's hand and God's favor and God's blessings to be taken off of them because they've seen what happens when God steps back and they don't want that. So when they find out that the two and a half tribes all of a sudden are potentially worshiping other gods with this giant altar, they get very angry. And so they decide to go out to war against their brothers. The way they handled this, I think, actually, was done very well. They didn't jump the gun. They didn't jump to conclusions exactly. They had Phineas, the son of Eliezer the priest, go out and talk to the two and a half tribes and really figure out what was going on before they just, you know, struck them all dead. They were willing to go to war to defend God's honor, but they didn't want to go to war. They really wanted to find out what was going on with this giant altar, first and foremost. And so it says that they sent Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the high priest, to go and talk to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. So Phineas goes, and Phineas was a very famous person already because Phineas had stopped the rebellion years before this in Peor. And so he was the perfect person to send to go talk to these two and a half tribes and try to get them back on the right page before anything happened. So Phineas, of course, is willing to go do this. He goes and does it, and he sits down with the elders of the Gadites, the Reubenites, and the Manassites. And he says to them, like, what are you doing? You know, why are you all of a sudden, you know, erecting this altar when you know we can't do this? Because when you do this, you're part of the Israelite community, and God is going to take his hand off of all of us. So either we have to stop you or we have to tear down that altar or we got to get you guys to come live in our land. We, we got to do something to stop what's going on here. He reminds them. Phineas is like, look, don't you remember what happened in Peor, which was the rebellion that uh, Phineas stopped? And I'm sure Phineas was very, very passionate about that subject because in Peor, if you guys remember, this was a story, I think in numbers, actually where the Israelites are worshiping Midianite gods and having like sex with Midianite women to worship their Midianite gods. And like that whole rebellion ended up happening. Well, anyway, during that rebellion, there was like this guy, I think he was one of the princes or the son of one of the princes. He took this Midianite woman and went into God's temple in front of everybody, or rather a holy place. We're not sure if it's God's temple or the outskirts of God's temple, whatever. But he goes in to a holy place nearby the temple or in the temple and begins having sex with this woman, this Midianite pagan woman. Phineas gets so angry and so upset that God's house is being violated in this way that he takes a spear, he goes in after them, and as they're in the act of sex, he takes the spear and he plunges it through the guy's back and through the woman's stomach. So all the way through both of them. And because of that, God's anger on the Israelites at that time relented because Phineas was jealous for God. And Phineas had this like zeal for God is what scripture said. He was zealous. He had a zeal for God. So Phineas, obviously, perfect person to talk to uh, the Reubenites, Gadites, and Manassites here. But anyway, so he reminds them of that rebellion that happened. And he's like, look, because of that, this plague came on Israel because of, of the corruption that happened at that time. And then he reminds them of Achan at the very beginning of Joshua. Achan, if you guys don't remember, stole stuff from God. When God specifically said, hey, don't take anything from Jericho, Achan was like, nah, I want that stuff from Jericho. And so he took the stuff. And so God got angry because if Achan would have just trusted in God's promises, he would have been able to take spoils from other cities. But he didn't wait. He got greedy. He got envious. And so he stole from God. And so God's hand 
got taken off of Israel for a short period of time because of that as well. Phineas reminds the two and a half tribes about these stories. And so that's where we ended today. But what I want to say is that I think that this was a very good response that Phineas and the Israelites had to what's going on here. And this is how we as the church are supposed to be responding to people who try to bring in ideologies and beliefs that are not in scripture. We are supposed to protect God's church. We need to protect God's church. And Israel is an Old Testament uh, version kind of of the church, if that makes sense. It's a picture of the church. Just as the Israelites together were a, a solid community where the Holy Spirit resided, that's exactly what the church is now. We're a community where the Holy Spirit resides, right? Except he resides in each one of us and not on the Ark of the Covenant. But regardless, the Israelites are a picture of the modern day church and how we're supposed to function as a group, as a community, as the body of Christ, right? And so we need to be very careful with what is allowed in our church. And how we do that is by scrubbing through scripture and reading it, firstly, so that we know for sure if something is a biblical teaching or not. And we also protect the church by making sure that no false teachers are able to cause any kind of division whatsoever. Because if the church is divided, it won't be able to stand. And people outside of the church will look in on that church and be like, hypocrites, they can't even stop the fighting in their own community to keep themselves like powerful and strong. So why should we even attend church? I always like to say, if the church is doing the exact same thing that everybody else in the world is doing, why would anybody want to go to church? The church is supposed to be different. The church is supposed to be strong. The church is supposed to be a place of hope where people can come and find refuge and security in that church and sound teaching and sound doctrine, right? That's the point of the church, not to mention to spread the gospel to every single creature. And so we spread the gospel by not being divisive, by not spreading false teachings that, you know, turn people away from Jesus. We're supposed to turn people towards Jesus. And the only way to do that is by giving them the truth, by giving them the scriptures that Jesus gave us. So anything that turns us away from God, that turns us away from Yahweh or Jesus is supposed to be expelled from the church. Even though we don't go to war, you know, physically, we go to war spiritually with these ideologies that are non-scriptural and we do our best to remove them from our church. So if you think something's going on in your church that you think is corrupt, it's very biblical to go out and find a different church. And there's also nothing wrong with going and talking to your pastor or your leader or your elders in your church and telling them what you think is scripturally wrong. Now, this is scary to do. My family had to do that. My mom had to go talk to our pastor of the church I grew up in and ask him and question him about something that was going on in our church. And unfortunately, our pastor kicked us all out. And a lot of times that's what happens when pastors or elders are confronted with the truth of the Gospels. They get angry and they lash out. And that's what happened to us. So it is very scary. It's very hard. And we basically got excommunicated from that church. <laughs> I basically lost all my friends, uh, except for one. But anyway, long story short, it's hard to do. It's hard to do, but if you want to stick up for scripture and if you want to be scriptural and if you want to stick up for Jesus, then that is something you might have to go do is to confront bad ideology that is taking over your church. And that's what Phineas had the strength and the courage to do because he loved God. He cared very greatly about God and what God wanted. And if we claim to love God, and if we care very deeply about what God wants, then we're gonna wanna stick up for God also. And one of the ways we stick up for God is by protecting our church. 
Well, I interviewed my sister and my brother-in-law on YouTube about the problems they experienced in the IFB church, which was also the church that I grew up in as well. And so we talk about all of that. And if you're interested in that, go down and find the description of this podcast episode and click on the link that takes you over to that YouTube video and just take a listen to it. But anyway, guys, I'll see you all tomorrow for an episode out of John. And then on Friday, we're going to finish up this chapter and talk about the response from the Gadites, the Reubenites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh and see what was really going on here. All right, guys, have a wonderful rest of your day. Happy listening, and God bless.